Checking piston clearance is one of the most commonly overlooked procedures involved with doing top end maintenance. In this video, I'm going to talk about why it's so important and also how you can check it without spending a whole bunch of dollars on fancy equipment like this. So first of all, here's the concept. The wear comes from the friction that's caused by the piston and rings going up and down inside the cylinder. So what we're going to get is we're going to get cylinder wear, although the cylinder is really hard, so it wears the slowest. Next, we're going to get piston wear. This piston you can see has a Teflon coating on it. And so the Teflon is worn off on the front and the back. That's where the piston wears the most. So the Teflon wears, the aluminum wears, and the rings also wear. The aluminum is really soft, so that's going to wear the most quickly. The rings are chrome plated, and so they're going to wear a little bit slower than the aluminum, significantly slower, but they're going to wear faster than the Nicosil. So the softest part of this whole scenario is obviously the piston. The thing to consider with that though, is the piston ideally should be floating in a film of premix of oil basically and that's why crosshatch is so important so if you look inside that cylinder it's got nice crosshatch and if you were to zoom in on that really far you'd see that the crosshatch looks like peaks and valleys and the oil creates a film through those peaks and valleys. The aluminum on the piston technically is sliding up and down and there should be a film of oil between the cylinder and the piston. So that's gonna make the aluminum wear a lot slower. It's gonna make the piston last a lot longer. Rings on the other hand are pushing hard against the cylinder. They're gonna see more friction than the aluminum, but since they're harder, they're not gonna see the amount of wear that the aluminum will. So those are kind of the concepts that we're dealing with. So when a manufacturer says you should change your piston at 80 hours, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, how much wear is going to be on the piston at this amount of hours versus on this amount of hours? How many times the piston goes up and down in the cylinder per hour or per kilometer, whichever way, has a huge effect on how much the Nicosil, the aluminum, and the rings are worn. So they're kind of doing a basic calculation on how much they think those components are going to be worn in a certain amount of hours and then giving you a recommendation that's just kind of like a birdshot spread. This is kind of when you should change your your piston. Now I think we can do much better than that if we pay attention to the wear on these three different components. If you're you know a novice rider or you're a weekend rider, you're somebody who just likes to go out and have fun on the trail, that piston's gonna go up and down way less times than somebody who's out there racing or riding aggressively or revving the bike a lot. When I get an engine on the bench, I measure the piston clearance, I check the ring end gap, I get an idea, okay what kind of rider is this and how much wear have they put on the cylinder and how how much wear are they going to put on the next cylinder? That allows me to give a tailored hourly base maintenance interval for each rider and each engine. I have riders, they'll go through a piston every 50 hours. I have riders on the same bike. I have no problem recommending that they go 200 hours on the same cylinder. So if you don't care, change your piston every 50 hours. But if you'd rather get four times the life out of your components, checking what your piston clearance is at and your ring end gap could potentially quadruple the life that you can get out of a top end. So how do you check piston clearance and what tools do you need to do the job properly? So here on the bench, I have a pair of cylinders that we're gonna measure. This one's out of a KTM 200. This is a 300 TPI. This is how I measure piston clearance. It's definitely the most accurate way to do it. I measure the piston with a micrometer and then I zero the dial bore gauge to the micrometer. It's called a transfer measurement from the piston to the cylinder wall. And that allows me to check front to back, side to side, up at the top, all over the place. These are snap gauges. I don't really like them, but they're way cheaper than this. These, you can buy these cheap online. And if you're careful, you can do a good job with the snap gauges. This is the cheapest and simplest way of doing it. Probably also the least accurate, but if that's what you got, you can do it with this you can get a good idea uh, as to how much wear is in your components okay so for the fancy tools method oh actually first here i'm going to show you guys something so front to back across the top of the piston got 71 and a half millimeters flip the piston down here we got 71.8 and the reason for that is that there's a whole bunch of aluminum here as the piston heats up and takes on heat it's going to expand more here because there's more mass here than down here. So we need to measure close to the bottom. I'm gonna make sure that I'm across the center of the piston, just above the bottom, rock it back and forth so that I'm not uh, hanging up on an angle or anything. 
just setting the tension and then I'm locking the micrometer there. And I don't care what this measurement is. I'm basically, I'm transferring the measurement from here to the dial bore gauge. And then all I care about is the difference. So I should also mention, you gotta make sure that if you want an accurate measurement, you gotta have everything really nice and clean. So there's special tools to hold micrometers and there's actually a special tool to zero the dial indicator. I don't have those tools. I'm not boring cylinders here. And I've done this lots and it's plenty accurate for checking piston clearance. Basically what I'm doing here is I'm just zeroing the bore gauge to the micrometer measurement. So I'm off here, I'm about a thou and a half off. I'm about half a thou off there. Now I'm doing this in Imperial because that's all my tools are Imperial. Of course, dealing with Imperial numbers is much nicer than dealing with metric numbers, as you all know. Okay, so that's zero. So this is now set to the piston size. Now all I have to do is go over, stick this in the bore, and I can check what the piston clearance is going to be. I should also mention that it's room temperature in here. Now I'm just going to put the bore gauge in there. Oh wow. So this one is a little over 5 thou. That's, a, that's quite a bit. So I'm going to check at the bottom, side to side. So we're a little less, just over four and a half there, but that's pretty good. That tells me that the bore is pretty close to round. Right, I'll give you guys an idea what's going on inside there. So I'm just putting it in there and then I rotate it back and forth to find the, and I just watch for the largest point. That's the nice thing about a bore gauge is you can look for the largest point as opposed to the snap gauges. They give you a one-time measurement and you gotta hope that it's the largest point. Okay, now we're gonna move from bore gauge to the next cheaper option, which is snap gauges. I think I'm gonna be right about this for a 300. I never use these for checking piston clearance unless the piston is too small for my bore gauge or too large. Yeah, that's gonna be right. How these work is there's a little tension screw here and that kind of locks this. As you compress it, oh, that's a little too much. It locks the, uh, the end pieces and then you can measure that. So I'm gonna get close here. I'm gonna be a little bit too big. And I'm going to lock, I'm going to put some tension on that and then rotate the snap gauge once. So now that I have this, I'm going to measure this. So now I'm going to see what the reading is on this and I'm going to write it down. Now that I've got my measurement written down, take my piston, measure in the same spot as we did before. And I'll see what this is and write it down on there, do a little bit of math, and then I'll know what my piston clearance is. Okay, so I've got my measurements. So bore is 2.837 and piston is 2.831. That leaves us with six thou, which is obviously one thou different than what we got with the bore gauge. Now, right off the bat, I trust the bore gauge way more. There are several variables with this. First of all, how I put it in, in the bore. Uh, second, this little locking mechanism, it could have a little bit of spring in it. So I don't trust this nearly as much, but that being said, you can be pretty accurate with these if you're careful. But if I was gonna use this to actually set up piston to cylinder clearance in an engine, I would be checking front to back, side to side, top and bottom, middle of the cylinder. And uh, I would be checking each one multiple times to verify my measurements. All right, final method, by far the cheapest, feeler gauges. By far the least accurate, but it will give you a good idea as to what's going on. I'm gonna start with my smallest feeler gauge. I'm gonna put it in the back so that I'm not dealing with my decompression hole. Drop it in like this. So this piston, this is a two and a half dial feeler gauge. Piston slides easily. Now I know that we're at five, so I'm gonna to go to four, but you get the idea. So at this point we know what our piston clearance is. What we don't know is what the bore was originally and what the piston was originally. That's where specs come in. This is a supplier catalog that I deal with and I'm using it because it's convenient, uh, but you can get these numbers pretty much anywhere. The Vertex website, if you go to it, it'll give you all this info. Piston diameter, this is an A piston, uh, 71.94. So the bore should be 72 millimeters and the piston diameter should be 71.94. Then you can go down to the next piston and it's 71.95. So that's the next size up. What we can do with these numbers, once we know that, if the cylinder has worn a hundredth of a millimeter, then you'd want to go to a B. Most of the time, it'll be just the piston that has worn that much. Cause like I say, this is aluminum. This is going to be the first thing that wears. Like I say, what we can do now is we can measure what our bore is and see whether we should stick with an A piston or a B piston. And we can use this to set up the piston clearance properly for our fresh rebuild.
So I have one more thing to mention about piston clearance, and that's regarding Teflon. Vertex pistons have a little gap in the Teflon that shows you where to measure it because you don't want to be measuring on the Teflon. A lot of other pistons don't have that gap in Teflon, and in those cases, Teflon is usually adds about half of a thou, but that's gonna wear off. As you can see, that used to have Teflon, it's pretty much all gone. And on this 200 piston, it's not as bad, but that's gonna wear off. So you don't want to measure your piston clearance on the Teflon, you wanna measure it on the aluminum. The specs that are in the book, that's how they measure it. They don't count the Teflon. So keep that in mind when you're measuring your piston clearance. So having a good understanding of what piston clearance is and how to measure it is gonna put you in the driver's seat when it comes to your top end maintenance. Whether you're doing the work yourself or having a mechanic or a shop do it, it's a good idea to know what it was at before versus what it's set at with the fresh top end. If you understand this, then you're going to be able to make an educated decision as to how often you should be doing a top end on your bike.